G'day guys and welcome to today's uh, video. Today's topic is quite a controversial topic uh, and we're looking at free ranging. Now when you hear free ranging you always think of the beautiful ducks, you think of the chickens, but the question is, and it's a very controversial topic, can you free range quails? And this is a topic that could get us into a lot of trouble, both with quail enthusiasts and chicken enthusiasts, because the simple answer is kind of. It is kind of possible to free range these magnificent little fellas. But if you're the kind of person that's just banging out in the great outdoors, uh, A, you'd be an idiot, and B, you'd be guaranteeing certain death for these small flappy friends. So to successfully free range quails, there's about four steps you need to do. So what we're gonna do is gonna get outside and out of the sun. Happy Australia Day, by the way, hence the hat. And we're gonna go on a bit of a journey to ancient Egypt to see how they did it uh, two to 3,000 years ago and see if it can be possibly done in an Australian backyard. Thanks for joining us. Let's so those of you that don't know much about quail, before we should go in uh, and talk about how to free range them, um, which is a form of free ranging, um, we should probably learn a little bit about them. Um, what we have is uh, Japanese jumbo quails, and as you can see, they come in a pretty good range of colours. Notice they're panting a little bit, it's another 36 degree day outside, so we just brought them in out of the heat. Um, you've got a beautiful, nice, like fawn or tan, uh, nice little white one, and a male, and the males seem to have the more marbling when it comes to their, um, their feathers. And if you have a look at this little fella, um, he's pretty cool. What's this guy's name? The, that is, I think his name is Caramel? Oh, I thought his name was Nutella. Nutella. Yeah, yeah, yes. Nutella. Now, Nutella. another thing we, we do is the average lifespan is about three years. Uh, three to four years we find for our quails. Uh, and one thing you'll notice that's a really good thing to do is uh, once you have your each litter that we have, you might be able to see if you hold that, you put just a really, really loose uh, cable tie on the leg, really loose. And you only put that on when it's fully grown because you'd hate to have any mishaps with it. And this is, and we use different colors to represent, represent different uh, generations. Now, as you can see, our quails are really, really tame. I've got my big mug right in the camera. I'm chatting, I'm chatting, I'm chatting. Apart from this fella feeling, feeling the heat, they're relatively tame. The deal with quails is it's what you put in is what you get out. If you want to successfully free range your quails, you have to spend a lot of time handling them and training them. But before you jump into the whole training thing, they're not like chickens. They do not go into coops at night. Uh, and the, ch the chicken's instinct to go to a coop at night is its greatest asset, which allows it to be able to be successfully free range during the day and safe from predators at night. You cannot obviously do that with a quail, uh, but there are some other strategies you can use to keep them safe. And we're gonna go into that in detail. Now, apart from our quails really feeling the heat, as you can see, they're in perfect condition. They're fit and strong. Uh, if you're ever buying a quail, number one thing is to check their feet. Uh, if you have a look at our feet, I just look at this little fella here, he's a little bit jumpy. Uh, you can see by that that they're completely clean and they're completely clear. Uh, often uh, the first sign of a bad breed is they'll have big amounts of uh, feces or poop stuck to it. That's a little secret for you. Always look at the feet. You can tell the health of a feet of a quail by looking at its feet. Uh, these these uh, are pretty thirsty. Another way really, really cool to tell. Usually the males have, uh, have, have better colouring, but if you want to make sure it's a male that uh, has to be sexually mature, when you grab its backside, when you lift it up, you'll see this kind of foam discharge. Uh, we all know what that is, uh, but it's a really good way to uh, ensure. Now, when uh, often you can get uh, a lot of eggs. So how many eggs do you get roughly from a, from um, a quail? I think it, 200 plus a year, but they stop laying uh, during the winter. Yeah, you're you right. Don't get they, an egg from them. they do completely go off the lane in winter, which actually is, uh, is, is not all bad because I like animals that get to have a rest. Uh, you can do that thing where you artificial light, uh, increase vitamin D and all that kind of stuff. But we always believe that all birds should be treated almost like a crop. Uh, they should have a harvest season and a rest period. Um, there is 120 species of quail, and I think in Australia you need to focus on, if you want to free range them successfully, two types. Uh, number one, uh, Japanese quail, which you see in front of you. And the number one might be a bit of a surprise, uh, they're called king quail. I think the Americans call them button quail. They're a small quail. Oh, you heard that noise, yeah. Japanese quails don't tend to really get along with king quails. I just say king quail and they get grumpy. Uh, the king quail is a native species of quail to Australia. There's about 120 varieties of quail. Uh, they're, they're a bushland bird living in long grass. Um, 
But yeah, the, these, these birds are vital. They have great eggs, you said about 120 a year. Yeah. Uh, remember, the thing with these Japanese quails, this has been bred for oh, donkey's years uh, for eggs, but as a result, they cannot incubate their own eggs. Now that's a very controversial statement. Uh, we find about one in maybe every couple of years, you get one that'll make a nest and happily sit on it. Uh, but for the majority of it, they won't. That's where king quails come in. And we'll bring one to the screen at the end so you can do a size comparison, air comparison. They're a quail that's been uh, picked up from Australia. As you know, Australia Day, we're about 200 years into our early country's history. And the king quail still sits on its eggs. We use our king quails to hatch our Japanese quail. You just swap over the eggs uh, and it works an absolute treat. We'll more about that later. The reason you're here is for free ranging. You've got a feel of the bird, you know what they look like, you definitely know what they sound like. Uh, they're noisy little buggers, these, these guys are gonna be uh, scooting back outside uh, for a drink and a cool down, because they don't really cope with the heat as much as chooks we find. Um, but let's talk about free ranging quails. Yeah, sorry about that strange donging sound before. You could hear the uh, computer trilling. That was just another quail walking all over the keyboard. Quails are quite mischievous birds, but uh, mis mischievous nature aside, in my opinion, they're a heroic bird that's capable of amazing things in the garden when that power is harnessed cr correctly. Uh, this journey to free range quail successfully, which we have done, which we do, uh, all started about 10 years ago when one of my friends, Bev, or Beverly, she came back from Egypt and she had this little pendant around her neck with a bird. And I was like, and I said, that's nice. Uh, what, I, what is it? She said, it's a quail in uh, hieroglyphics. And then it opened my mind. And I thought, if I had it back then, that must have been a pretty cool bird to be to have sur survived as a domesticated species for so long. So I started researching and found some old documents on how they would weave uh, secluded areas for birds using uh, their reeds and their bushes and all kinds of stuff. So for the last four or five years, uh, my daughter, Sophie and I, uh, we've been trying to replicate uh, Egyptian style uh, quail free range farming system and the benefits are off the charts. Uh, and let's, let's get into it. So as I mentioned, uh, true heroes of ancient Egypt. Uh, we all know ancient Egypt with Cleopatra, the fantastic, uh, the fantastic pyramids. You know, we all know about that favorite animal, the cat, the sphinx, all that kind of stuff. But the true favorite animal, or the second favorite animal, uh, which fed the slaves the, that built the pyramids, some say the slaves, some say it was construction, some say it was voluntary. Either way, these dudes that built, built the pyramids were fed quails, quail eggs, quail meat. And if you spend a bit of time on Google Images, you will find hundreds of photos of artifacts depicting the quail. Oh, this is obviously a plastic cast one here, but um, it was a sacred bird in their culture um, for many reasons. We've all heard about the old um, Moses, the plagues and that. Um, the main reasons the Egyptians kept uh, the, the quails in captivity uh, in, yes, in their vegetable gardens was to fight pests. They didn't have insecticides, uh, they didn't have herbicides, they had quails. Now, the first thing I want you to forget the word free range, get that out of your mind. I want you to substitute it with the word renter. You all know those renters that are that trash the joint because they've been there too long. If you have a quail free range system, what we do is we do three out of seven days. Three out of seven days, our quails spend in the vegetable garden. We're gonna get into that in a minute. And the other days they stay in their secluded coop. Uh, and it's obviously a deep litter, composted coop, uh, steel sides, all that kind of stuff. The next thing you gotta remember is You've got to have your quails trained for this. Now, so at night time, tell us, how do you collect your quails? What do you do? Um, you have to have a cat carrier. You have to put them in. Um, you have to be able to handle a quail. Um, and it has to be quite docile. And you only get good quails from hard work. So um, you'll see in a video, I'll, I'll just jump in and I'll show what my quails are doing today in Veggie Patch. Uh, you will notice that they're really friendly. They're really approachable. And at the end of the day, we pick them up and put them back in their coop. So it's a day renting scheme, three days a week. Uh, let's get back into it. So we decided to build an Egyptian style vegetable garden. I thought it would be kind of cool. Uh, we just used uh, H3 treated, um, uh, treated uh, eco pine, so you've got no nasty chemicals. First of all, we built a four by three um, sort of a raised veggie patch and we measured it out. 
Then we put in our concrete footers up, and then we went back and put the wire so nothing can dig underneath and we worked on the door. Uh, then we built the fence. Now you might notice that with our garden here, it's got complete access around all the way. And as you can see, we free range chooks. This was many years ago before our garden was established. Um, we raised our garden beds. Now you'll notice this, when things are really tender, you do need to protect them. Um, we'll talk about how to minimize crop damage um, with quails. First thing is you've got to remember females eat way more protein than the males because the females are pumping out an egg, 200 in fact a year. So the males will wait, walk around wasting time eating a lot of vegetables, whereas the females, because they have that higher protein, they need 22 grams in their feed, good to remember, um, 16 to 22, 20, 20 when they start. Um, because they have that, that drive for protein, they're more voracious, voracious, whatever that word is, hunters. So in your vegetable garden, in ours, we have a ratio of one, one female to about um, six females. So it's not a huge amount of amount. It's about two garden beds per chook. Uh, I shouldn't say chook, because I'm thinking free ranging per quail. All right, now let's, uh, let's have a little look at it. So this is just a, a stylized look at our garden because it's very important for us to talk about predators. Predators are serious problems. Obviously, you've got to catch your quails at night. Um, second of all, you'll notice our large veggie patch. What do we have over the veggie patch to stop aerial predators? We have a net. So the net, it keeps out any birds so they don't just swoop down and take them. Exactly. And the next thing you'll notice in this really uh, fun PowerPoint map is our vegetable garden, although it was, uh, we didn't make it square, but we were just having fun, so for and I, has complete access all the way around it. We have a guardian dog. Tell us about the guardian dog. Uh, we have a dog that roams around. So, I think he's in the house. He's in the house causing trouble at the moment because he's trying to get out of the heat because he's a la lazy bug. We, we have a kelpie that we've trained up with our chooks at free range. And the chickens free range outside the, the inner perimeter all day, cruising around with the dog. And that guarantees you get nothing dig under it. So, you have to think to yourself how you're protecting against large predators and small predators. Now, you might be thinking to yourself um, before we are scoot, how do we keep the quails off the vegetable garden. First of all, um, you don't always want to. If you have things like spring onions and garlic, and you're gonna think I'm mental, but I'll tell you anyway, when they grow to about uh, six inches and you plant them out, your quails will hammer them down to about one inch, right? That is the best thing you can do for seedlings. I know a lot of people probably turn the channel off and think I'm, I'm crazy, but I guarantee do an experiment. They'll grow back better, they'll grow back stronger. Uh, then we have, uh, it's ex exclusion cages, little cages that we've made. I'll show one at the end. And if things need resting or things are too tender, we cover it. The thing about quails is they're, they're petrified about aerial predators. So nine out of 10 times in our veggie patch, these guys cruise around the per perimeters of our raised veggie beds, which creates an inner perimeter. So it's almost like a castle. So you've got the big chooks outside, cruising around the entire veggie patch, eating the slugs and snails. And then on the inner veggie patch, we have the quails and they cruise around between the garden beds predominantly due to fear of aerial predators and get more bugs. I'm telling you, it's the best bug management system on the planet. Remember, three days a week, no more than three days a week. And it's not a set and forget. We don't want those lazy gardeners out there. You've got to check, you've got to monitor the health and sometimes cover things uh, and work out what's uh, the hot topic at the moment. Um, a good tip is if you've got a dog like us, we've trained our dog to find the egg. So when we take him out, the dog runs around the perimeters, finds the egg, sits down. We've got about four seconds to pick him up before he wolfs him down. So you've got to be on your toes, but you can create systems to speed up. Um, let's have a look at our veggie patch today. All right. And this is just a, uh, some footage that I took for us. Let's, uh, let's uh, have a look at it. As you can see, the heavy gauge netting. Uh, open the gate and let's uh, let's cruise in. So I probably should wash my hands a bit more. They're a bit filthy. As you can see, it's pretty pretty cool. There's not no obvious signs of damage, and the quails are very at home, very relaxed. And you'll see them. As I promised you, due to fear of aerial predators, they spend most of the time. Uh, yes, you will get a bit of dust bathing, but you've got to expect that as they pick through the plants. But if you if you're really really sure. And you can just play with the bus. That didn't make any sense. I'm a little bit distracted by how cute these are. One thing you'll notice with our quails is, as I mentioned, completely approachable. 
they'll stop for a pat, they'll come and check you out. And this is those exclusion beds. You can have small, all you gotta do is get a bit of hard rubbish, an old washing basket and put some netting over it and you can protect plants that are more vulnerable. And let's just, uh, so a couple more seconds, looking at our veggie patch in action before we go out. There's, a, there's our little male uh, cruising around. It's up there somewhere. There he is up the back. And as you can see, three days a week, these girls cruise around. And let me tell you, Sof, what's it like when you open that cage and they leave? Uh, what, what, how, do you, how do they behave when it's uh, veggie day? Oh, they, they love it. They jump out. They try to jump into the cage. They already know what to do. It's really weird. On on the three days a week, um, when they're free ranging, or should we use the phrase renting during the daylight hours, as soon as you open that cat car, instead of walking, they do this hop, which is pretty crazy. You would have seen a heavy gauge net to stop aerial predators. If we had more money when we set up, we would have doubled the height of the um, of the vegetable garden because that would have made them even less uh, the raised garden beds. But we ran out of cash, so you've got to do what you've uh, got in your means. Um, now we probably should have a little look at uh, results. Uh, this is uh, yesterday's and the days before uh, results. Uh, and as you can see, dahlias from the garden, which put them there to, and roses to make a little more fancy for you YouTubers. As you can see, I don't want to waste the time, let's press both. This has been the last, uh, last probably, uh, this is twice weekly harvest. As you see, we've got the babcos, we've got all kinds of things going nuts in there, squashes. Um, quail eggs. Yeah, got the quail eggs compared to the chicken eggs and passion fruits. And as you can see, we get great results. Now the question is, why not use just pesticides? We believe in regenerative agriculture. We're a big, we're a big believer in that. But we also believe in producing the best food for our family. Um, and one thing that a lot of people don't really talk about on YouTube, I don't know if it's politically incorrect, but we're going to jump there, is why go to all the trouble when you can just kill chemicals using bugs? Now, there's this guy called Fritz Haber, and he was a, a German in the, I think, 1912. He got a Nobel Peace Prize, and he, he knew this guy, right? And he worked out how to take nitrogen from the air and make the fertilizers we use today. And he won a Peace Prize because all of a sudden, uh, from Germany outwards, they could feed the feed the masses. But then World War Two started. What What do you know about World War Two, Sof? Um, um. Lucky it's Australia Day, so we'll, we'll focus maybe on more Australian Indigenous history uh, later in the next video, maybe. Yeah. So in World War War Two, so I want to mean they dug these trenches, Sof, to get away from the machine guns, which was a relatively new invention. Well, Fritz Haber, this German scientist, had just discovered how to make different uh, gases. And using his technology of getting nitrogen from the air, they created these things called mustard gas, which, so it's not like the mustard that you put on your sandwich. It was this horrific gas that burnt your, your lungs. It actually would make, make, would make your veins rupture and you dry, drown in your own blood. Probably a bit dramatic for YouTube, but they, what happened is it blinded people, it hurt people. And so what after the war they did was they diluted it, they made it a lot less strong, and that's where pesticides are from. So, so chemicals originally designed to kill humans were then modified after World War One to kill bugs. And so if you can get rid of any pesticides um, in the garden, uh, you're healthier for it. Now considerations. Handling. Why is it so important, Soph, to handle the chickens? This picture here. Um, so they can actually, so when you pick them up, they don't fly away. You can catch them if they're not in where they're meant to be. Um, yeah, I think that's that, No, that's cool. And another thing is um, male to female ratio. As I mentioned before, five, no more than, say, for our 12 garden beds, we have five females, one male. Because uh, the males are good for good for the crew because it helps the eggs fertilize for your next generations, but also they have eat less protein. And this is just from our studies. Feel free to disagree, but we've been doing this for a couple of years, and we've tried running three or four males, and when they're not fighting and having scraps, they seem to really decimate the crops. So get that male to female ratio, males as low as possible. Handling, as as you mentioned, is important, and we do clip the wings. Um, and that does help with catching, but once you get that really good rapport or connection, catching is never a problem. Uh, and occasionally you'll have whole garden beds that you want um, you want secluded. And what we do in this, uh, Soph made this actually. Uh, this is practiced. 
by picking the, the quails in and seeing if the chickens could get out just with a bit of a lie. But as you can see, this is a, fits over the entire garden bed, so I just made it with a bit of recycled wood and chicken and chicken wire. Now this goes on top of the garden bed and oh so should I say does it fit the garden beds? This probably but does it fit on the garden stuff, beds? And yeah, it does. And as you can see, this fits on top of the entire garden bed. We made just one to fit. And this is crucial, because if you have those tender crops, for instance, spring onions, once they're over like 10 centimeters, they will, and you've got a good diamond on them, quails won't touch them. But while they look like grass, they will have a bit of a nibble. So there are times you have to protect plants. But even if you've got that big protector, entire garden bed protected, still having the quails cruising around in there guarantees no pests higher yields and you get a bit of in incidental fertilizer occasionally you get these these nutters that go oh the touch crops you might get who knows meninja cockle rabies all kinds of rubbish from having a quail near your uh, veggie patch she hasn't died my family hasn't died the dog hasn't died just uh, take a deep breath and re realize we are human beings uh on a planet with animals so the whole touch crop thing uh you yeah, forget about that in my opinion i uh, just live a little and take a risk so yeah, so considerations, protecting, predators, of course, as I mentioned. Um, and so that was just so in my learning goals for the lesson. Um, hope you enjoyed this. Um, give a big thumbs up, give a like. Sorry about this grain in quality. Uh, just using a bit pretty dodgy old computer, but we liked because we could use the digital stuff. Free range inquiries, it is possible, but we refer to it as renters. Three days a week, protect against those predators get your systems up, and I guarantee you'll get results. But as I mentioned, so if it's not set and forget, don't flick them in there for the day and hope for the best. Look, observe, monitor, protect. The benefits are huge. Pesticides are non-existent and yields are up. Regenerative agriculture at its best. And get yourself some king quails because they're the best free incubators on the planet. So do you anything to say about king quails before we go? Um, I don't think so. They're actually, but you do have to click their wings. Because if you yeah, they're, are they're, putting them outside, they are great flyers. Yeah, king quails, you never ever really handle that much, we find, because they're too flighty and they're too valuable uh, and they're too expensive, to be honest. So for them, they stay in their coop, they don't free range, and you use them as incubators and give them the best possible life in a good sized coop. All right, before uh, we leave you, uh, we thought we just might quickly sum up by showing you the actual physical differences between a uh, beautiful Japanese quail, and as you notice, they're just chilling, they're happy, enjoying life. Uh, the Japanese quail, which we all uh, know and love, has a nice large uh, speckled egg. Compare that to a uh, king quail. Shall I just bring in the screen? Uh, the size is, is, pretty, uh, is pretty significant, okay? Still edible, bang them in the frying pan, have yourself an omelette with about 50 of them. Um, and I just thought for the camera, it might be really sweet just to bring up a uh, king quail. Here's one I prepared earlier. But as mentioned earlier, they're a lot more flighty. They're uh, definitely not a domesticated wild bird. And if you have a little look, hopefully this suit will, so as you can see, they're light, they're fast, and hopefully we can just put it in down. Is this a he or a she? She, she, no, she. And no. as you can see, maybe if she sees an egg, she might calm down a bit. And uh, drop her on the table and let's watch her fly off and then we'll go chase her. For the camera, that's our king quail. Compared to Womp, a Japanese quail. And you can see the size difference. They're generally not compatible species, uh, as in they don't live that well together. We've tried a couple of times, but it's not worth it for the animal welfare angle. Uh, but as you can see, uh, he's calmed down a bit, about to fall off the table. But uh, overall, two great species that uh, when worked together, gets great results. This fella, uh, for uh, the eggs we eat, and the pesticides, and uh, this fella, so off my holder up to the, four uh, incubation reasons. And one thing that's really funny is they literally eat maybe a tablespoon of grain of, of feed, literally a week. Um, so before we go, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've had a great time learning about free ranging these magnificent birds. If you like the video with Soph and myself, happy Australia Day, give it a big uh, Aussie thumbs up. And subscribe and if you get a couple more subscribers and views maybe we'll make some more on strategies to free range chickens in a full garden without damaging one plant yes it's possible you better believe it mister